Footballers are typically confined to their positions, strictly adhering to the specific areas of play assigned to them. However, there was one footballer who quite literally shattered that norm, demonstrating an ability to play virtually anywhere on the field. His name is Ruud Khalit, arguably the most complete player this sport has ever seen. Our story begins on September 1st, 1962 in Amsterdam. Young Root enjoyed a relatively happy childhood in a neighborhood renowned for its friendliness, coziness, and open kindness. His mother was his grandfather's only child, while his father's family resided in Suriname. This meant there were very few relatives around him during his formative years, leading to Root not particularly embracing Christmas like other children. Introduced to football at a young age by his Surinamese-born father, who had played for the national side and top league team Sunny Boys, and Transvaal, Rude's passion for the sport took root. Root's family later moved to another part of Amsterdam, the district called Amsterdam Old West, where he met his good friend Frank Reichard, who also lived in the same area. Like their fathers, the boys became immediate and close friends, bonded by their shared love for football. Though attending different schools, they took the same number 7 tram from Rude's house to school. When Rude mentioned Frank to his father, he discovered that they played football together on the same team. At the age of 8, Rude joined an amateur football team called Mere Boys near the Ajax Stadium. However, after his family moved to Amsterdam West, he joined another amateur football club called DWS Amsterdam located nearby. The significant advantage of this club was that it provided Rude the opportunity to train and play at Ajax with the best players of his age group. The experience exposed him to the various levels of power and prestige in football life, despite the ambitious players around him not reaching the professional game's highest level. His foray into professional football began at DWS, where his imposing athletic builds set him apart. A year after his debut, with DWS, he convinced his friend Frank Rijkaard to join the team, making this the first time they played together. By the age of 15, Rude became the captain of his team, undoubtedly the best player. Barry Hughes, the coach at the professional football club Harlem, noticed his talent and approached him. However, at that time, Khalid had not committed to pursuing football as a lifelong career. His father, aware of the challenges and uncertainties of a career in football, opposed the idea, wanting Rude to continue his education. Despite the opposition, it was never a reflection of doubt in his son's abilities. Barry Hughes came to their house and spoke to him. Khalid's father told him to come back at the same time on the same date next year. Young Rood was already gaining a lot of popularity. There were a number of other scouts sounding out to his father at the time, including some from Ajax, but Barry did just what he was told, and Rood ended up at Harlem. He trained with the Harlem first team every day. By that time, football was the only thing Rood was thinking about, and as his father feared, involvement with the game at such an intense level affected his schoolwork. Rude tried to balance his school and football life, but it was very exhausting for him and it seemed an impossible task. At the age of 17, he made his professional debut for FC Harlem, the youngest player ever to kick a ball in top-level Dutch football at the time. His first position was center-back and he looked pretty good in that position. However, a year later, he changed his position and became a striker. In that season, he scored 14 goals and his team was crowned champions of the second division. He became the player of the year for that season and won his first trophy, the silver boot. It was during the 1980-1981 season when English club scouts began to take an interest in him. The manager of Arsenal, Terry Neal, and Don Howe, the manager of West Brom, came over to Holland to watch him play. The asking price for young Rude was 200,000 sterling, but since Harlem was struggling financially, he was told that Barry was prepared to go down to 80,000. In his third season with the club, Harlem finished fourth in the first division and qualified for Europe. Unfortunately, he was not part of the team that later competed in the UEFA Cup because in April of 1982, at the age of 19, he signed a three-year contract with Feyenoord. The Rotterdam club paid £300,000 for his services and therefore his European debut would have to wait until an ill-fated trip to Scotland a year later. However, in that season, Khalid made his debut in the Dutch international team alongside his good friend Frank Reich card against Switzerland on September 1st, 1981. The Dutch team lost the game 2-1. Khalid made an appearance as a substitute in an attacking role, and five weeks later he played his second game for Holland in Eindhoven's Philips Stadium in front of 30,000 Orange fans. They beat Greece 1-0, and the coach, Keyes Rivers, said he was pleased with Khalid's performance. 
He was very young and naive when he joined Feyenoord, but he felt welcome there. When he joined this team, he mostly played as a striker or as a number 10, which meant that he had little to no defensive duties at all. Even though he and his team were performing very well, the Rotterdam team ended the year trophyless, four points behind the winner Ajax. However, the trophyless time did not last very long, since the next year, Feyenoord won the league as well as the Netherlands Cup. Khalid was named Dutch Footballer of the Year in recognition of his contribution to Feyenoord's success. At Feyenoord, Khalid occupied an increasingly advanced role in midfield, having played predominantly as a sweeper at Harlem. However, the biggest and probably the most important thing that happened to young Ruud was that in that same season, arguably the greatest Dutch player in history, Johan Cruyff, joined them. Khalid was delighted to be playing alongside him. As a young player, who else could he wish to be learning from other than the master himself? In fact, he was privileged to work with two of the biggest names from the great 1974 World Cup squad. Besides Cruyff, Wim van Hannigan was also part of the Feyenoord team, not as a player but as an assistant manager. Van Hannigan and Cruyff were in their mid-30s, experienced men of the world who had seen everything there was to see in the jungle of professional football, and the advice they lavished on him was something Khalid will never forget. Forget. They played a crucial role for him to form a mentality that Hulit carried throughout his whole career. His extraordinary form and play earned him a place in the national team to qualify for the 1984 European Championships in France, but they didn't make a very good start, drawing 1-1 in Iceland with Reykjavik. It meant they needed a good result against the Republic of Ireland in their second match in Rotterdam. At that stage, Ireland had a clutch of more useful players, including David O'Leary, Liam Brady, Frank Stapleton, and Mark Lawrenson, and therefore, they were favorites in the group along with Spain and Belgium. Still, the Dutch team managed to beat them 2-1. And in that match, Hullet scored his first international goal. He considers it one of the proudest moments of his life. After that match, they played France in Rotterdam and lost 2-1 to the likes of Platini. However, after that match, Platini praised his performance on the wing. Almost a year and five international games later, on October 12, 1983, the Dutch team journeyed to Dublin for the return group match with the Republic of Ireland. The Netherlands was two goals down well before the end of the first half, but they roused themselves after that. Hullet scored the first goal for Holland, and soon after that, Marco van Basten equalized with an assist from him. The match was very tight between them, but Hullet managed to score his second goal to clinch the game. This was a sensational win for the Dutch team and a big turning point for Dutch football because the coach decided to do without some of the older, established players like Ruud Kroll and rely on younger players like Hullet and van Basten. It was seen within the country as a big gamble, but they did well and it paid off, and that night was really the moment the 1988 European Championship winning side was born. From that day, Holland went forward with a new generation calling the shots. After that match, Hullet became more and more familiar with his Netherlands shirt. They went on to beat Spain 2-1 in Rotterdam, and again, Hullet got the winner. But all was to no avail because they failed to reach the finals. Spain had one game left in the group and had to beat Malta by 11 clear goals to progress at their expense. Unfortunately for the Dutch team, Spain won 12-1. This was very shocking news for the Dutch team, resulting in them failing to qualify for the tournament. However, Gullit did not let this disappointment greatly affect him. His next season had an amazing start, looking like it would be his best one so far. However, everything changed in March when he got injured. Due to injury, he had to miss a lot of games in the later half of the season, which had a drastic effect on his team's performance as they finished the season in third place behind PSV and Ajax. Even though he was probably the most important player for his team in the last years, he became the focus of a race row as manager Thijs Liebrechts was alleged to have referred Hullet as Blackie and criticized him for being lazy. The next year, he joined another Dutch giant, PSV. His transfer to that club was not an easy decision. Despite everything he had done for them, the crowd gave him a very hard time. They didn't want Hullet to leave and branded him as a wolf, which in Holland signifies that you are hungry for money. Still, the truth was that he just wanted to improve himself as a player. After he announced his decision to leave at the end of the season, some of the fans threw bananas at the pitch and screamed at him every time he got the ball. He felt like they had forgotten that during his time at the club, the team had won the league and cup double. In his new team, he had a number 10 jersey. He was the main player of the club and the coach had built the team around him, the new captain. At 23 years old, becoming a captain was an issue for a lot of supporters. However, he soon proved his naysayers wrong. He brought his charismatic personality to the club and dictated the whole game for PSV with his intelligent passing and forceful sprints. He had a role as both a maestro in the field and a finisher in the attack. His outstanding 
commanding strength and height proved to be extremely effective for PSV, resulting in him scoring 24 goals and providing 13 assists in 33 matches. His effort proved successful for the team as they won the league for the first time in eight years. In that year, Rinus Michels became the coach of the national team and his task was to take the team to the 1986 World Cup to Mexico. In their qualifying group were Hungary, Austria, Cyprus, and Bulgaria. They finished second and went straight into a two-leg playoff with their neighbors Belgium losing the first game nil to one and winning the second two to one, but going out on the away goal rule. The disappointment the players felt was immense and their dreams of making it to a major tournament shattered again. Even though Rude was extremely successful in club football, the 1986 World Cup qualifier was the most important tournament for him where he failed to deliver. However, a good future was awaiting them. The following year was no different for him. He managed to score 22 goals and provide 14 assists in 34 games, helping his team become back-to-back -back league winners. It was no surprise that he became Dutch Footballer of the Year once again, and this was the time he began to establish himself as a world-class footballer with his distinctive dreadlocked appearance catching the eye of Europe's biggest clubs, including AC Milan. PSV was well aware that they had a world-class player at their disposal and would only accept top dollar to let him go. In the prior summer, the technical director of AC Milan had seen Hullet in action and approached him in Barcelona during a preseason tournament. The price tag for the young Dutch talent was 7 million euros, which was a record-breaking fee at the time. Hullet was not the only Dutch star that the Italian club acquired. Marco van Basten, who was the main rival of Hullet in Eredivisie, also joined the team and the team had high hopes for the Dutch duo. Before Hullet joined Milan, the team was undergoing a very interesting process. It was a mere shell of its former self from the 60s. Bringing back the old glory was the reason why the young and charismatic Silvio Berlusconi became the president of Milan in 1986. One of the first things that Silvio did in the team was appointing Arrigo Sacchi as the manager. Even though he was somewhat successful in Parma, his credibility was questioned since he had never worked in Italian Serie A before. At that time, Time, Italian football was strongly defensive, and Saki tried to challenge the formation by implementing his own, with the main man to deliver that being Rude Hullet. When he arrived in Milan, he weighed 89 kilos, which was very strange for the Milan department since they had never seen a player with such bulk. They thought he was fat and too heavy, but he soon proved everyone wrong. His position at first in the Milan team was on the right wing, with Van Basten in the middle and Pietro Verdes on the left. He played for Holland in the midfield, but he didn't disagree with where the manager Arigo Saki wanted him to play. He never complained. Saki did try him as a midfielder, but his opinion was that he was better as a forward. After Van Basten's ankle injury, Milan switched from a 4-3-3 formation to a 4-2-2 and he just clicked up front with Virtus. Van Basten's almost season-long injury was the reason why Khalid's role drastically had increased on his team. Saki was strongly reliant on him in the goals department. The Dutchman thrived immediately upon arriving in Italy. Milan won against Juventus and Turin for the first time in 14 years. He scored 9 goals and assisted 10 times in his first season in Milan, which seems to be weaker than his previous stats, but we have to keep in mind that Hullet was doing much more in Milan than in Eredivisie. He had the role of both a playmaker and striker and was dictating the style of play of his team. The title race between Napoli and Milan was very exciting. The game between them was the decider of who would become the Italian champions. When Hullet and Campania arrived in Nepal, the fans tried their max to create an antagonist atmosphere. They followed the bus of Milan, spitting at it and generally hurling abuse. The hotel where the players were staying was surrounded by huge barriers and massive fences to keep the paying crowd away. Dinner was prepared by Berlusconi's personal chef and none of the hotel staff or waiters was given permission to go anywhere near it. The food was brought out of kitchens surrounded by Berlusconi's personal bodyguards and they never stopped watching over them, accompanying them in the lift and spending the entire night walking up and down their corridors. Quite clearly the club was terrified that someone would put something in the food that would affect their performance in the game. The Napoli fans' sole mission that night was to keep them awake, but there was no chance of that because they were so high up, but there was no chance of that given how high up they were. But somehow, a number of them managed to get onto the floor above them and made some noise. The next day, when the team was going to the stadium, a huge crowd followed them again, chucking stones, tomatoes, oranges, and anything they could find. This was the level of importance that this match had. As you'd expect after all this fuss, the game turned out to be an incredible match. Videos scored the first goal for Milan 
Milan, but two minutes before the end of the first half, the referee awarded Napoli a free kick, which was scored by legendary Diego Maradona. Throughout the whole game, he was marked by a Napoli player, but after that player got a yellow card, he was able to get a little freedom. Varadis was able to score another goal, which was soon followed by Van Basten's goal, and even though Napoli managed to score again in two minutes, the championship was Milan's. Despite the previous attempt to negatively affect Milan players, the Napoli crowd applauded the Milan team after the final whistle. This was the level of respect the Italian football is known for. Thanks to him and the fresh and effective methods of Saki, Milan was crowned as champions of Italy for the first time in nine years, and the main man behind that was Dutch superstar Rud Hullet, which was the reason why he was voted as the best foreign player in Serie A. Almost everyone in football knew about him, and to no one's surprise, he was given the most prestigious trophy a footballer can get individually, the Ballon d'Or, which he dedicated to his good friend Nelson Mandela. Reggae music was a very strong passion for young Hullet, and he was spending some time in that industry too. He was frequently using the stage to spread the word about Nelson Mandela and Steve Biko. One such example was in his song, South Africa with Revelation Time. At that time, he was becoming more than just a football player. He was becoming a global icon with a distinctive and unique look and outspoken views. He was becoming one of the world's first global football superstars. At that time, winning the Scudetto was not the only challenge he was facing. After failing to qualify for major tournaments three times in a row, the Netherlands finally managed to qualify for Euro 88. They entered the tournament not as favorites, nor as underdogs, which was the reason why no one was particularly surprised at their poor start when they lost 1-0 against the Soviet Union. However, in the next match against one of the tournament's favorites, Hullet and Van Basten showed their masterclass. The latter managed to score an amazing hat-trick against the British. Even though the England team had a very strong squad, they were powerless against Van Baston, who was in superb form. With that match, the Netherlands showed their true strength and proved their naysayers wrong. The next game ended in a similar fashion with a goal from Kiev. The Dutch national team won very comfortably against the Irish team. In the semi-finals, the Dutch national team faced probably their biggest rivals, the West Germans. The Germans were hosts of the tournament and probably the biggest favorites to win the Euro. The game was extremely tight. Lothar Matthews opened the score for the German national team, but in 20 minutes, Ronald Koeman's penalty allowed the score to transition into 1-1. By the end of the game, at the 88th minute, Van Basten scored the winning goal for his team, and thus the Netherlands were the ones who went to the finals instead of the hosts. This win was very important for the whole country. While the players had a party after the game, people were dancing in the streets by the time there. In fact, the night before the game, they were still in a partying mood, and the whole team went to see a Whitney Houston concert. Even Marco Van Basten, who doesn't like dancing at the best of times, was swinging his hips as Whitney gave her all. Even though they had been told to remain seated, some people might think that it was a bit reckless to go out and enjoy yourselves the night before a major match, but going to that concert was a therapeutic experience for the players, according to Hullet himself. And the players ended up in excellent spirits the next day. The Dutch national team dominated the whole game, and thanks to goals from Hullet and Van Basten, they won the game without any problem. As the captain of the team, it was his proud duty and privilege for him to lift that precious trophy for Holland. They were the first first Dutch team to win a major tournament and part of the reason for their success was the camaraderie and spirit within the squad, generated by days on end of living and training together. Dutch football was on the top of the footballing world. The first season for him in Milan was the easiest because there were no great standards to be maintained, no high expectations to fulfill. The squad was able to just say, let's go for it. In his second season, even though he had better stats than the first one, scoring 11 goals and 7 assists, the focus shifted from Serie A to the European Cup campaign. Milan had some incredible games, particularly against Red Star Belgrade and Werder Bremen. Against the Germans, they scored a perfectly good goal. The ball had crossed the line by a good foot, but the Portuguese referee missed it and they went back to the San Siro with a goals draw. However, in Milan, they won 1-0 with a penalty and in the end, they were the winners. The climax of the 88-89 season came in the European Cup finals against Stella Bucharest in Barcelona's Nou Camp Stadium. There was some serious doubt over Hullet's availability in that game because five weeks earlier in the semi-final against Real Madrid, which Milan effortlessly won 5-0, he was carried off with cartilage damage that needed surgery. In the first half, he had cut inside from the left and attended a shot on goal, but he didn't connect properly and his knee went. 
Khalid went straight to the sideline where his knee was manipulated back into place and during the halftime interval it was treated with ice. He did come out for the second half and scored but he made the mistake of going for another fierce shot on goal and that time the knee completely collapsed. With the final only a month away he went to Rome for an operation, made a quick recovery and was back playing again within three weeks but his problems weren't over. The day before the final Khalid experienced some terrible sciatic nerve twinges that left him with little to no movement in his back. He turned out for training that day but the pain was unbearable, so much so he could hardly walk. The Bucharest coach was out and about spying on that session and he must have gone away convinced that Khalid wouldn't make the starting lineup. That afternoon he underwent some intensive treatment but it wasn't making much of a difference. So he had a session with the club's sports psychologist Bruno Di Michele who spelled things out for him from the start. Rudy, it's very important if you want to play that you show the team you want to play. Khalid immediately understood exactly what he meant by that. He was suffering and showing it instead of hiding it. There was no pretense, he was just walking around with a pained expression on his face and Bruno made the valid point that such an attitude, even though genuine, would give his teammates no confidence in him at all. They wouldn't expect him to play and if he did play they would be worried about him and therefore not concentrating on the game and giving it their all. Furthermore, looking injured would give his opponents a psychological boost. This gave him confidence to work on himself and after intense training and resting he was able to play that game. When he walked onto the pitch he was uplifted yet again by the sight of a huge mass of red and black in the stadium. Because Romania was still under the dictatorship of Nicolae Ceausescu, hardly any style Bucharest fans had been allowed to leave the country. There were 80,000 Milan fans in the new camp that night. He felt such a sense of elation with backing like he could climb every mountain. From the moment he stepped onto the turf he had the look on his face which read, here I come everyone. He was up for the game even though he was still injured. He was the one who scored the first goal which made him feel very grateful due to his injury. Van Basten scored the second and then they knew that the cup was theirs. When Khalid scored the third it was just confirmation and it was sheer ecstasy for him. Marco nabbed a fourth a short time later and truly sealed the win. In the 59th minute Root was substituted. The fans applauded him off appreciating his contribution to Milan's success on the night. He came off with cramp which is hardly surprising given the amount of time he had been out for his operation and recuperation. However, journalists wrote that he had been taken off because he was suffering from pain in his knee, which was just false information. Nevertheless, he was a happy man as he sat down on the bench because AC Milan had won the European Cup. When he finally got his hands on the cup with the big ears, he had such a pure feeling of joy, something he had never experienced before. Even though he was feeling extremely joyful, the pain that was caused by the injury was still causing him problems. But he had no time to rest. He had to go with the Dutch national team to Finland for a vital World Cup qualifying tie. There was no chance of him starting the match but the management still wanted him there even if it was just to sit on the bench. However, the team was performing very badly and it wasn't long before he was being asked to get on the pitch, so he did. He managed to produce a good cross for Wim Kift who scored the winning goal that ensured Holland would make it to Italia 90. Finally, after previous failing attempts, the Netherlands managed to qualify for the World Cup which caused another night of celebration. After the game, Khalid felt nothing in the knee. There seemed to be no problem at all so he went out with his friends. The next day it was perfectly normal as well and he assumed that he had made a miraculous recovery. But on his way back to Milan, the same thing happened again. When he got off the plane, the knee had thickened up. He needed another operation to resolve the problem within. This time he was able to take a holiday and give his poor knee some time to rest but when he returned to Milan for preseason training, the knee swelled every time he went for a run. It was full of water and horribly uncomfortable. It was obvious that he needed some time to recover from his extremely serious injury. Milan at that time had a different kind of style, a fusion of Dutch philosophy, all-out tactical attack, and the Italian one, sit tight and don't give anything away. The mixture was formidable and AC Milan was six years ahead of their time. In December of 1989, Milan made their way to Tokyo and won the World Cup Championship, beating South American champions Atletico Nacional of Colombia with Evan scoring the winner in extra time. But back home during his third season in Italy, regrettably, things were to turn a little sour. He was often out dealing with the repercussions of his knee injury and managed to start in only two Serie A games, scoring one goal. But again, Milan had a great end to the season, retaining the European Cup in Vienna at the expense of Benfica and again he made another surprise appearance in a major final. Milan needed 
extra time to dispose of KV Mechelen of Belgium in the quarterfinal and again against Bayern Munich in the semi. At the time of the final, he had only just come back from yet another operation but Saki wanted his presence on the pitch. It was certain it would have a beneficial psychological effect on the Milan players and a detrimental one on the Portuguese. They won the title of European champions for a second successive time with an angled goal in the 68th minute from Frank Rijkaard. The following season, 1990-1991, was the first since his arrival in Italy that Milan failed to win any domestic or European silverware although they had beaten Olympia Asuncion of Paraguay in the World Cup championships in Tokyo. Two goals from Frank and one from Strop once again gave them the title of the most powerful club in the world and that compensated to some extent for their coming failures. Also, Rude returned to fitness after his layoffs the previous season, managing to play 31 games. There was bitter disappointment in the European Cup. Milan entered the competition in the second round after a bye from the first and were held to a goalless draw at the San Siro by Belgian champions Bruges, fortunately beating them 1-0 in the away leg. At the quarterfinal stage, it was Bernard Tapier's Olympique Marseille versus Silvio Berlusconi's AC Milan, the clash of the tycoons. In the home leg, Hullet scored in front of 83,000 people after just 14 minutes, but Jean-Pierre equalized before the halftime, and the second half was goals. They were without the suspended Marco van Basten for both legs, and Marseille were definitely up for the return leg with the tasty prospect of knocking out the reigning European champions in front of a noisy home crowd. It turned out to be one of the most bizarre games he has ever played. In front of an ecstatic 38,000 capacity crowd, Chris Waddle scored a goal 15 minutes from time, but a short while later the floodlight failed and plunged the stadium into darkness. The players left the field and officials at the club managed to get some form of lighting going again. After a long break, the Swedish referee ruled that the game had to go ahead, but they refused and stayed in the dressing room. UEFA took strong measures against them, changing the result to a 3-0 win for Marseille and banning AC Milan from taking part in any European Cup competition for one season. As if that wasn't bad enough, at the time there were doubts about Hullet's fitness being voiced, and Milan brought in Jean-Pierre when but Jean-Pierre deal was struck, the Frenchman was supposed to have agreed to sit on the bench as Hullet's understudy. Milan now had six foreigners under contract, and there was a heated debate as to which of them should be first team regulars because at the time, the three foreigner only rule was still in force. A club was allowed to sign up to six foreign players, but the regulations restricted the team to fielding only three at the time. The unlucky three, no matter how much they cost or what their status in the worldwide game was like, had to sit out the match on the bench. There was no reserve team football in Italy, so if you didn't play in Serie A, you didn't play at all. Fortunately, Hullet had the support of Berlusconi, but Arrigo Saki had left to take up an appointment as coach of the national team and Rude felt like he never had the support of the new coach, Fabio Capello. He was constantly in and out of the side. Saki used to talk to him for hours about team tactics and strategy, but he never had the same rapport with Capello. In the 1992-93 season, Rude was only selected for 15 matches, scoring 7 goals, but by the middle of that season, he was already sick of the constant sniping speculation over his fitness. The situation culminated in a straight contest between him and Jean-Pierre for selection for the 1993 European Cup fight against Marseille. He wasn't even picked for the bench. This made Hullet extremely disappointed, even though he was more or less accustomed by that time to non-inclusion in the Milan side. He recalls one bizarre incident in particular. He was packed and ready to travel to an away game one day because the team manager Ramaconi hadn't informed him that he wasn't in the squad. As he was boarding the team bus, Capello asked him where he was going. It was pretty obvious that he was getting on the bus to go to the away game with the rest of the players, but there had obviously been a total breakdown in communication. This made Rude extremely extremely angry at the time because he made him a fool of himself. But the worst thing at the time of the European Cup final snub was the rumors flying around more than ever that he had glass knees, couldn't play two matches in a row, and wasn't reliable. Nothing hurt Hullet as much as that because he knew it wasn't true. Those stories often appeared in the newspapers, but Milan did nothing on his behalf to dispel the slurs. They certainly didn't encourage them, but neither did they deny them. It became a source of immense embarrassment for him, and he also had to contend with the frustration of his position in the squad. If he wasn't picked for the team, how could he prove he was fit? He loved Milan so much and thought he had helped to create something special there, something unique. When he arrived at Milan, the team hadn't won anything for 14 years. They were in a desperate state, desperate to win something, and he worked very hard to help them to achieve that. But by that time, he felt very bitter and he was being turned away. Despite all of 
that, he never bore any grudges towards the club itself. He could never hate AC Milan. At the same time, he was having problems with the Dutch national side as well. But again, he could never hate Holland because of it. It was not the institutions themselves, it is the people that helmed them. People come and go, but the club and country remain forever. Overall, Milan was a great experience for him, a wonderfully and highly successful time. However, by the time Milan lost the European Cup final 1-0 to Olympic Marseille, his time there was over. There was no point in turning up for training anymore. He wasn't in the team, he wasn't even on the bench. So while the speculation about his future raged on, he decided to go on holiday. He was being linked with all sorts of clubs at the time. Marseille, PSG, Atletico Madrid, Bayern Munich, Torino, even four Japanese clubs. And everyone seemed obsessed with him because he was available on a free transfer. It might have been wonderful publicity for him that so many prestigious clubs were interested in his services, but in reality he was sitting at home and there was nothing on offer. The rumor factory and their glass knees tail had put too many people off. However, he was convinced by the chairman of Sampdoria, Paolo Montavani. Gullit really respected the man who reminded him how he had something to prove from a professional point of view. After all the misleading reports in the Italian newspaper, everyone thought that his his knees were permanently dodgy, but Sampdoria gave him the platform to prove everyone wrong, that he wasn't finished as a top-class footballer. That season, he was on a mission. His first season with Sampdoria in 93-94 was the equal of his first one with AC Milan, the best he had ever played in his career. He was more relaxed in Genoa than he had been in Milan, mainly because the club wasn't always front-page news. There were the times at Milan when he was sick of seeing his name in the papers. Sometimes a week wouldn't go by without the word Hullet in a headline. At the training complex in Milanello, there would be at least 20 reporters turning up every day, but at Sampdoria, things were more laid back. In his first season with Milan, Khalid scored 6 goals in 6 weeks, and he did the same for Sampdoria at the beginning of the season. By October, he was the leading scorer in Serie A. He had only been at the club for 2 months when journalists started asking him what has happened. There were no longer discussing his glass knees and how he couldn't perform twice in a row. Finally, they began to listen to his point of view, and he explained to them how he had never made any statement about his injuries when he was at Milan, and that all the fuss was pure speculation and rumor. Now he said that he was playing for his dignity. There was no more important Serie A game for him than Sampdoria against Milan in the last weekend of October. The week before the match, he was asked by every journalist if he had an intent on revenge, which made him laugh. He didn't hold any grudges against his former club. His mission at Sampdoria was simple, to prove his fitness, help the club achieve great things, and show everyone that he could still play at the highest level. Berlusconi had said a couple of days before the game that maybe he had made a mistake thinking that Hullet was past his peak after all those knee operations and he was taken by surprise by his early season form with Sampdoria. In the same breath, though he described him as a Milanista, and that his feelings towards him as a person had never changed even though he wore the shirt of a rival team, he had no doubt that Berlusconi didn't want him to play against his club. The Milan fans too were surprised by the fact that he had played every week for Sampdoria. After a record-breaking 72 weeks at the top of the Serie A table, Milan was knocked off their perch, beaten 3-2 by Sampdoria after leading by two goals at halftime. Khalid was the one who scored the winning goal with a shot about 10 or so minutes from the end of the match, and he was deliriously happy about it. At last, he made his point. Not everyone was happy with the fact that Khalid celebrated that goal. The Milan fans and even the players felt offended because they interpreted his celebration as evidence of a mean spirit, and a man seeking revenge who has just found the best and most humiliating way to do it. But as he has said, that was far from the truth. They only thought like that because they really didn't know what Khalid had gone through, what a huge weight that goal lifted off his shoulders. In Italy, they described his performance that day as one of his greatest ever games. Games. The bigger the occasion, the greater the pressure, the better he plays. However, the chief memory for him from that season was the death and funeral of the club chairman, Paolo Montavani. He had been sick for some time and spent a long period in the hospital. When he died, his body was kept in the hospital for a while to allow friends and family to pay their last respects. But although he went to the hospital, he didn't want to see him. He wanted to remember that man as he was the first time he met him when he made such a big impression on him. The funeral was a very emotional emotional moment for Hullet, the burial of a man loved by so many people. He was a family man through and through and made all his players feel like part of that family. 
Sampdoria was noted throughout Italy as a family club, largely thanks to him. A few ditch, but Mantovani's legacy lived on and demonstrated the new spirit in the team when they went on that season to win the Italian Cup, which, of course, was dedicated to the memory of their loved and much respected chairman. Hullet's decision to leave Italy for Chelsea was made from the heart and the head. The reason for that was that his life in Italy at that time was in a mess, full of personal, private problems. He played his last season in Italian football in the 1994-1995 season with Sampdoria. Although he had plenty of footballing nature to occupy his mind, the club won the Italian Cup that season. Few people, only those very close to him, knew the details and extent of the emotional ructions going on. He was very low at the time for a number of reasons. Some of it had to do with his return to Milan for a short while in the middle of a very bizarre 93-94 season. He went back because the club approached him to say that they had made a mistake by selling him too early. When they approached him, Khalid didn't really hesitate. He was also delighted by the club's reaction because it meant that his mission had been accomplished. He had proved them conclusively that his knees weren't made of glass and that he still had a lot to give to a big club. When he went back to Milan, he was in very good shape, but Milan at the time wasn't really playing well. In just one game against Lazio, with just four minutes to go, they equalized to make the score 1-1. Then, just one minute before the end, Hullet scored the winner. The newspapers were all shouting that Hullet was the only one who could save Milan. The previous year, Milan had won the Italian Championship and the Champions League, and now, suddenly, Hullet was the only one who could save them? It was at that moment when the problems began. He had a meeting with the vice president of Milan, Mr. Galliani, at which he spelled out the problems he had with the footballing side of things at the club. He told him that if Milan felt they couldn't resolve those things, then he would appreciate being put on a free transfer again. He really did want to stay, but the whole episode didn't work out. And after he returned to Sampdoria three months later, he was a nervous wreck. For the first two weeks, he couldn't play football. Fortunately for him, there were some very kind people at Sampdoria, the family club, and they knew that Hullet was in torment. He entrusted his innermost feelings to them, and uncannily, they knew exactly what his situation was and how he had to deal with it. When he came to the end of the season, a decision had to be made, and it was a very, very difficult one for him. Primarily because he was a public figure, and he was painfully aware that whatever he did would affect those closest to him. He had offers from several European giants, even though he was old in football terms. He was linked to Bayern Munich, Galatasaray, Monaco, Feyenoord, even the Japanese club Yokohama Flugels, and PSG. The French club was ready to pay handsomely for his services, but in the end, Chelsea was the one who succeeded. Glenn Hoddle, the manager, had several phone calls and later meetings with him and was able to convince him to join them. Thus, the new adventure for Rude Hullet had begun, and it turned out to be a difficult departure for him. His biggest regret was leaving his kids. Hullet's ex-wife was awarded custody of them by the court, but he also felt sorry saying goodbye to the people at Sampdoria who had been so good to him. Also, despite all of the ups and downs, he had been in Italian football for eight years and in a bit of a wrench just to close a large chapter of his life, but he was desperately looking forward to a fresh life in London. And on June 22nd, 1995, his new life and career officially started. Initially played as a sweeper by manager Glenn Hoddle with limited success, Hullet was moved to his more familiar role in midfield where he scored six goals. The signing of Hullet, alongside the likes of Mark Hughes and Don Petrescu, propelled Chelsea to the semi-final of the FA Cup, although they only finished 11th in the FA Premier League. Hullet had some difficulties adapting to the style of play at Chelsea. I would take a difficult ball, control it, make space and play a good ball in front of the right back, except that he didn't want that pass. Eventually, Glenn said to me, Rude, it would be better if you do these things in midfield. His adjustment, however, was rapid, and he ended the season by being named runner-up to Eric Cantona as Footballer of the Year. Hullet has since often stated in interviews that it was in London he enjoyed his career the most and felt happiest. Every time I played for Chelsea, I thought, nice game, beautiful stadium, great crowd, I'm playing well. It was the only time I really had fun. In moving to Chelsea, Hullet played an important part in the foreign revolution as numerous high-profile international stars such as Italian Gianfranco Zola and Dutchman Dennis Berg camp joined Chelsea and Arsenal respectively, which helped to increase its worldwide profile. However, the most important time during his career in Chelsea started in the next season when the coach Glenn Hoddle was offered the job as the national coach. He was offered to take Glenn's job. Being the coach is not an easy job. If you have to deal with a huge array of characters, all of them diverse in nature, the necessity of personality generating an atmosphere where the players are willing to do and try out things for you, and the ability to solve problems on and off the field quickly and 
began painlessly. Khalid had realized that and that was why he didn't immediately take the job. However, Chelsea supporters helped him to make up his mind. They were the main reason why Khalid agreed to become player slash manager of the club and he proved to be extremely successful in that role too. Khalid made a promising start to his managerial career when, in the first season as a player manager, he guided Chelsea to an FA Cup triumph in 1997, the club's first major trophy in 26 years. In doing so, he became the first manager from outside the British Isles and the first black manager to win a major British football trophy. The club also finished at a credible sixth place in the Premiership. Even though his second season looked promising as well, he had a disagreement with the board and president of the club, which resulted in forced retirement for him and thus he had to finish his two decade long career in such an undeserving way. However, despite all of that, he left one of the greatest legacies in football history. One of this era's most exceptional talents, a figure whose legacy will endure for eternity. An embodiment of the Dutch philosophy of total football. His adaptability, a rare quality in today's game, defined his essence. Proficient in virtually every position, this towering figure seamlessly fitted into any tactical setup, be it a sweeper, midfielder, winger, or striker. A true athlete from his formative years until his 40s, Captain Dredd possessed a blend of speed, endurance, towering height at 6'3", and formidable upper body strength. His mastery of street football techniques complemented his skill set, making making him peerless on his prime days. Graceful and poised with the ball, relentless and fierce without it. He was an unstoppable force during his early days at PSV, and notably at Milan, where his legacy as a superstar and legendary team remains vivid. Transitioning into punditry, he leveraged his influence to challenge barriers and advocate for significant causes undaunted by a lifetime of racial abuse. As one of the trailblazers in Dutch football alongside Rijkaard, they reshaped the landscape, paving the way for future generations. Those fortunate enough to witness Hullet's prowess firsthand know him as an artistic juggernaut, ranking among the most complete players in history.